The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining us today. This is the first in a series of webinars that we are hosting on work zone traffic control and safety. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center. I'm very pleased to have my colleague, Raymond Brushhart, who is our safety circuit writer for the state of Ohio. And he is going to be your instructor um, for all of the sessions. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do want to go over a couple of housekeeping items, and then I'm going to put you and raise very capable hands for the presentation. Um, the first thing is, is you can ask questions anytime using the question box in the GoToWebinar panel. And I would encourage you to put questions in there as they come to mind. Um, I will wait for Ray to either take a breath long enough for me to pop in and ask him the question, or I know that periodically he'll stop and ask me if there's any questions in the question box. Secondly, we are going to be doing some polls today during the webinar. And if for some reason on your screen, the poll doesn't want to allow you to answer it, it's probably because you're in full screen mode and you'll just need to hit the escape key and then it'll take you out of full screen mode and then you'll be able to answer the poll. Next, we will be sending out a PDF of the slides that Ray is going to go over today and a follow-up email. We do not have it available in the handout section right now for you, so nothing to worry about downloading. Just wait for that email to come in with a link to the PDF of the handouts. We are also attempting to record this webinar, and if it's successful, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to that recording. Last but not least, we know that some of you may be sitting in a conference room with more than one person watching this webinar. If you're doing that and you want to get credit for everybody in the room, we need you to do a sign-in sheet with names clearly printed and then a signature next to it. Put at the top of the sign-in sheet the name of the webinar, which is you know, Work Zone Traffic Control and Safety, the date, the time, and then get that emailed into Ray and his email address is on the screen right now and he will take care of making sure that everyone who signs in gets a certificate. So those are all the housekeeping items I have, Ray. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Very well said. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Victoria said, I'm Ray Brushhart, safety circuit writer for the Ohio LTAP Center. I hope everybody's feeling okay today and ready for uh, some exciting work zone information. Uh, this is a four-part webinar series, and so this is the first part. A um, little bit of background about me. Why am I teaching this class? My background has always been in traffic engineering and roadway safety and uh, transportation planning. And uh, I haven't always worked for ODOT. You know, I used to work for a local government agency for 15 years. I worked for the city of Columbus and their traffic engineering division. So I've had some experience uh, dealing with traffic issues and uh, work zone or maintenance of traffic um, plans and things like that at, at uh, the state and local level. So um, let's go ahead and uh, begin. So, you know, each, each part of this webinar series is about an hour and a half, and today we're going to cover uh, a lot of general information about work zones and where to find valuable work zone information. And uh, we'll get to learn about, uh, you know, some manuals that you need to know about and how to find them online. Uh, you know, we'll fo first learn about the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, otherwise known as the OMUTCD. You might want to remember that. It sounds like a quiz question. And, uh, and how the manual is made up of nine different parts. And the part that we're interested in is part six, which is called the Temporary Traffic Control Manual. And so um, I think you're going to need to write that down or something to remember that for later. So um, so inside this uh, temporary traffic control manual is all kinds of information about work zone traffic control. You know, there's more than one way to say work zone traffic control. You know, you can use these terms interchangeably. You can call it temporary traffic control um, or maintenance of traffic 
or MOT, which stands for maintenance of traffic. So, uh, you know, as we look at the different resources to find work zone traffic control information, you know, I'll be sharing you uh, the ODOT Office of Roadway Engineering's page and uh, where they refer to it as maintenance of traffic. And so that's a, one reason to remember that. And so we'll also be, uh, you know, looking, you know, inside the temporary traffic control manual at these uh, things called typical applications. So they're like 46 different typical applications and they're all like uh, different uh, examples of work zone setups uh, on different types of roadways and different, uh, you know, different uh, locations within the public right of way. So we'll get uh, more in depth into that. And uh, we'll also be discussing uh, the different temporary traffic control devices, such as cones and drums, barricades, arrow boards, and other safety devices, maybe like uh, truck mounted attenuators. And um, so that's uh, about as far as we'll get today. We'll also be talking about some roadway safety statistics like crash statistics involving work zones. We've got the, the latest hot off the press statistics from our Office of Highway Safety. And I wanna share that information with you. And um, I think about that, after the, about that, we'll be kind of running out of time. So, and then, uh, you know, we'll meet again uh, for part two. And so, um, let's move on to the next slide here. So. Uh, Hopefully by the end of this webinar series, uh, you'll, you'll gain a basic understanding and awareness of temporary traffic control and uh, different uh, work zone setups and standards. It's important to know uh, that each typical application has a set of standards uh, that go along with it and uh, also some guidance and options and supplemental information. And uh, you'll also realize the importance of uh, setting up your work zone properly uh, in order for everyone to be safe, not just the workers. Of course, we want the workers to be safe. Uh, but uh, once we get to take a look at the, some of these crash statistics, uh, we'll realize how important it is for motorists and other road users to be safe as well with our work zone setups. So, you know, that's kind of the point of this manual so that uh, we know how to set up work zones so everyone can be safe. And so today we'll be discussing uh, the fundamental principles behind temporary traffic control and then delve into looking at uh, different traffic control devices and safety hardware. Okay, so let's start with our part one, and that is, uh, you know, to talk about the purpose of temporary traffic control. As you can see, we have four main purposes. You know, one, we need to provide advance warning to motorists and other road users uh, as they approach our work zone. We don't want to surprise the motorist. Uh, they need advance warning. You know, it's kind of a combination. They need advance warning and guidance around us. And so, you know, we have, um, you know, like our signs, our orange diamond shaped signs, and uh, maybe some high intensity strobes, things like that, that are a part of the advance warning area of a work zone. And then we need to, those signs are going to communicate to the motorists uh, of the proper travel path around us. And then we use our temporary traffic control devices once they get to the transition area and our buffer and workspaces. We use our temporary traffic control devices like our cones and drums, maybe barricades, or maybe even if it's a long-term work zone, use concrete barriers uh, to delineate the areas for them not to use and to make sure we do a good job of separating their travel area from our work area. And we define our temporary traffic control in our work zones as a system to communicate with road users to safely guide them through a roadway affected by 
construction and maintenance activities, utility operations, or disasters, special events, and incidents. So where, where do all these rules or regulations or specifications come from in the first place that tell us how to set up work zones and, and just to set up uh, or install any type of traffic control? Well, I guess you could say they come straight from the top, um, from the U.S. Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration. They publish this federal manual on uniform traffic control devices, and uh, it establishes the minimum federal standards applicable to all roads open to public travel. And so every state has the option to either abide by this federal manual or publish their own state manual, which meets or exceeds all the specs of the federal manual. And uh, there's a, an announcement for this manual, as you can see on the screen, that this is the 2009 edition that I'm showing you. However, this past December, this manual was finally updated. So, um, so that was big news. So there's a lot of changes that uh, you'll be hearing about uh, within the next year, I think there's going to be some training come out uh, to talk about changes in each of the different nine parts. But here in Ohio, uh, we have elected to publish our own manual of uniform traffic control devices. So here's the picture of our 2012 edition of the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which is published by ODOT. And since the uh, federal manual was just updated, uh, that means that we have about within two years to come up with our own Ohio supplement to the federal manual. So uh, we are busy working on updating or coming up with a, uh, a new supplement to go along with the federal uh, update. And so uh, you'll be hearing more about that as time goes on. And so, and as you can see, there's nine parts to this manual. It's all about traffic control of all kinds. So, um, you know, you've got a, a part on your permanent roadway signs like stop signs and uh, curve ahead signs and things like that. And then you, there's another part for pavement markings of all kinds, and then there's a, another part for traffic signals. And then you get into different parts that are associated with, uh, you know, specialized locations like uh, school zones. You know, school zones has their own part. Railroad crossings, they have their own part. Bikeway and bicycle and pedestrian facilities has their own part. And then there's a low volume roads part. And then the one we're interested in today is part six, which is called the Temporary Traffic Control Manual. And so, you know, we can talk about the Ohio Revised Code and how it's associated with the OMUTCD. The, um, you know, the OMUTCD establishes the standards for design and use of all traffic control devices on all public roads in Ohio. And um, it's a state law uh, that local jurisdictions abide by this manual in all nine parts of the manual. So the Ohio Revised Code, that's the fancy way of saying Ohio State Law, sections 4511.09 through 4511.11, um, it starts out by stating that local authorities in their respective jurisdictions shall place and maintain traffic control devices in accordance with our OMUTCD for a uniform system of traffic control devices. And that's in, uh, you can also read that in Appendix B2 of the OMUTCD. So local authorities cannot just make up their own designs for signs, pavement markings, school zones, railroad crossings, work zones. So they have to abide by the OMUTCD, all nine parts as a state law. So. This is the section of the Ohio Revised Code uh, that establishes that requirement. 
So to uh, summarize that, the OMUTCD is published by ODOT. Part six is what we're going to be working on with this webinar series. It deals with temporary traffic control zones. And the manual receives input from a statewide committee made up of public and private sector officials. And uh, we um, have begun the process of gathering these uh, statewide public and private sector officials uh, as we uh, organize for our updated supplement to the newly updated MUTCD. Okay, let's talk about these typical applications um, that are inside the temporary traffic control manual. There's 46 of them. And the reason why there's so many of them is because every roadway is so different. And, uh, you know, it's got a lot of variables. You know, there's uh, the location of where you're working on the roadway. That means inside the right of way. You might be off the shoulder doing some mowing or you might be doing some work on the shoulder of the road, or you might be um, maybe a combination of on the shoulder and in a lane of traffic, or maybe you just be in one lane working, or maybe in two lanes, or you might be closing a whole street down. So those are different locations, uh, different highway types. You know, you've got two lane roads and multi-lane roadways. You've got local roads, you got freeways and expressways. The geometrics of your roadways are, you know, there's a lot of differences. You might uh, be working in southern or southeastern Ohio on a two-lane rural road that has a lot of curves and hills and dips, uh, or you might be on a, a nice straight road, totally level, like in northwest Ohio. Um, you might be working at an intersection or an interchange, and uh, some more variables include the volumes of the road. You might be low volume or high volume. You might be on an arterial road that carries commercial traffic. Um, and of course, the speed of traffic. You know, each roadway has a different speed limit. And uh, beyond that, um, your work duration of your project uh, is going to have variables. You might be working on a mobile operation like a pavement marking striping operation where you're continually moving or you might have a, a, a pothole patching operation where you're slinging cold patch into multiple potholes on the street as a mobile operation um, or you might be working in a stationary position for an hour or less that's a different work duration or an hour to 12 hours during the daytime is another work duration. And then you get, uh, you know, a work done that needs to be set up, you know, after dark or overnight. Uh, that's another duration. And then up to three days is another one. And then over three days is long term. So the duration of your work in the right of way has a big impact on how you design your work zone. And uh, the type of work you're conducting might uh, have an impact on the design of your work zone, whether you're trenching or maybe uh, you know, locals do things like leaf pickup or tree trimming or um, what else, you know, pothole patching, resurfacing. Um, and then above all that, um, when we get to taking a look at these typical applications, you're going to notice that all the pictures, the illustrations look just like state routes. So, uh, you know, it, with my background, I started out at ODOT and uh, learned how to, learned a lot about work zones. But then after about five years of ODOT, I went to the city of Columbus and uh, quickly realized that uh, setting up work zones on a city street is vastly different from setting up a work zone on a state highway. Uh, there's a lot of differences between a city street and a state route. You know, you might have things like uh, either curb and gutter streets, you might, uh, you know, they have sidewalks, lots of pedestrians, they got closely spaced driveways, closely spaced intersections. You know, at ODOT, we might have interchanges that are two or more miles apart, but on a city street, 
You might have intersections, you know, 400 feet apart or something. Um, lower speeds on city streets. Uh, these are all big differences. And so if you work for a city, you'll, you know, a lot of times you have to alter, you know, modify these typical applications to uh, actually fit the conditions of your city street. You know, you, you have to pick a, a typical application that uh, kind of meets the spirit of your location, so to speak, and then alter it to meet uh, those conditions that differ from a state route. So we'll have some examples of that in this webinar series. And so these typical applications consist of two pages. And um, the first page is an illustration. It shows you the type of road and where the work zone is. And then it shows you what signs you need to use and how to set up your cones and the location of a buffer space and things like that. And then the notes page uh, consists of um, a list of standards and guidance and options and uh, support information. So it's important if uh, you know you work for a city or local government, you know the illustration usually isn't enough to help you uh, set up your work zone. You need to read the notes page. It's very important to read the notes page, and uh, it discusses a lot of things to help you. So let's take a, a look at an example of a notes page. Um, you know, first of all, when we see this notes page, you'll notice that the standards are written in a large bold text and the guidance are written in italics and the option and support information are shown in a smaller text. So, you know, each one of these typical applications are, have a number, one through 46, and a nice catchy specific title. So here's a, a notes page example here, uh, typical application number 17. And the title is mobile operations on a two lane road. So it's telling you the type of operation and the type of road. So we're not talking about mobile operations on a freeway here. It's very specific mobile operations on a two lane road, one lane in each direction. So let's take a look at some of these standards Okay, the standard is a shall condition. When you select this this typical application, you must meet the standards, no matter what street you're on. So what's it say? So the first one is uh, uh, you need a sign, and um, you'll see in the, the illustration it goes with this. You need a sign on the back of your shadow vehicle uh, that, uh, you know, is specific about what's going on in front of that shadow vehicle. You know, if you're patching potholes, you should have the, you know, the sign of the, there's a symbol of a man with a shovel sign. It's usually a good one to have. Um, then the second standard is uh, your requirement to have, to display high intensity, rotating, flashing, oscillating, or strobe lights. Okay, and uh, at ODOT, we've, uh, recently updated our lighting package on our work trucks so that we have high intensity strobes on each corner of the truck and uh, a light bar across the top. And so you can't select just any truck to be your shadow truck. So you need a specific lighting package for a 360 view. And um, and then the third standard is if an arrow board is used, it shall be used in caution mode. So the, the caution mode, as we'll see in the illustration, is uh, the, you have a, the four corners of the uh, arrow board are lit up and flashing. That's caution mode. You know, we do not want to use an arrow when you're on a two lane road because, you know, there's traffic coming the other way and uh, you would be creating a, a head-on collision. So uh, you want the caution mode for the arrow board. And so uh, then we get into guidance. I like to call standard guidance an option. I like to refer to them as safe, safer, and safest. You know, I, I like to preach that um, anytime you're working on a roadway that has 
high volume and or high speed and or uh, site distance restrictions to uh, make sure you're including what's listed in guidance and options. You know, the ODOT roadway crews, they're always working on roads that are high volume and high speed. And some of our two lane rural state routes have site distance restrictions like curves and dips and things like that. And so they're always uh, using what's uh, discussed in guidance and options. So let's take a look at these as where practical and when needed, the work in shadow vehicles should, you see the word should when it comes to guidance. So you should be doing this unless you have a really good reason not to. Should pull over periodically to allow vehicular traffic to pass. You know, so if you're on a two lane roadway, you don't want to create a big mile long backup of traffic behind you. And so, you know, state routes or two lane state routes usually have a nice shoulder to pull over onto and let traffic go by. And, um, but the thing is, if you work for a local government agency, you might, your two lane roads might not have nice wide shoulders to get completely out of the way. You might not have any shoulder at all on a county road or township road. And so, um, you got to think about that before you select this mobile operation. And, uh, you know, you don't have to pick the mobile operation. You can set up a flagging operation, for instance, instead, if you think that a backlog of traffic is going to create uh, a bad problem, uh, like rear end crashes at the end of the queue. You don't want to create that situation. So you got to think about how you're going to. Um, handle uh, a queue of traffic behind your mobile operation. And so uh, the next one talks about uh, just kind of giving instructions to the shadow vehicle. It says the shadow vehicle should slow down in advance of vertical or horizontal curves that restrict sight distance. So here they are mentioning sight distance restrictions. And so the uh, one of the objectives of the shadow vehicle is to not disappear around a curve or over a hill from traffic that's approaching from behind, especially if it's a 55 mile per hour two lane road. Uh, you don't want to surprise that motorist coming over the hill or around a curve, and there's the shadow vehicle uh, stopped or moving very slowly. That would be a cause of a crash. And so uh, another guidance is to equip your uh, the sign on the back of your vehicle with two high intensity flashing lights to draw attention to it. So that enhances the safety. And then we get down into the options. So what I call safest. And so on this one, you could um, add additional shadow vehicles uh, behind the work truck and uh, and you can uh, even include a shadow vehicle to slow traffic down coming in the opposing direction. And then it says law enforcement vehicles may be used for this purpose. So you'll notice that several typical applications uh, mention that in the options for law enforcement vehicles to be a part of your work zone. And uh, that you know enhances the safety because people really pay attention to their lights, right? Even if they don't pay attention to your amber lights, they will pay attention to the law enforcement lights. And then last but not least on this typical application, it's like, you know, we've done all we can do as far as avoiding a crash or preventing a crash with all of our thinking and, you know, reading all the standards, guidance and options. But number nine says a truck mounted attenuator may be used on the shadow vehicle or on the work vehicle. So that's like the big crash cushion. So we've done all we can to prevent a crash, but yet a crash still happens. And so the job of the truck mounted attenuator is to absorb that crash and lessen the uh, impact and severity of that crash. You know, ODOT crews are familiar with uh, vehicles crashing into our truck mounted attenuators and uh, how well they work. I mean, we've we've had truck mounted attenuators hit on high speed divided highways by 18 wheelers. 
you know, going 65 miles an hour and there was no serious injuries either to the driver or to our work crew. So they really do work. So that's something to, uh, to look into. So if you're, if you work for a local government agency that uh, is commonly working on a high speed two lane road and your mo mobile operations are your go-to setup, maybe think about, you know, acquiring a truck mounted attenuator uh, or even, you know, researching a grant for that. Like, you know, there are grants available. There's one at the uh, Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation called the Safety Grant uh, that has been used for expensive work zone equipment like truck mounted attenuators and aero boards. So that's something to uh, look into. So this is just an example I wanted to discuss of uh, what a notes page looks like with its list of standards, guidance, and options. Hey, Ray. So this is what, yes. Is it time for a poll question yet? It could be. Yes, let's uh, make it time for a poll question. Okay, didn't want to interrupt you because you were on such a roll, but I, I just was on a roll there. Was, uh, yeah. All right, I'll just queue up the first one you gave me and launch right. it. So Ray's not going to be able to see this, but I will read it off to him. And if you are in full screen mode, you're not going to be able to respond. So hit your escape button to get yourself out of full screen mode, and that'll allow you to respond to it. So let's see, we're going to hopefully get at least 80% of you voting. Right now we're up to like almost 40%. And it says local jurisdictions have the authority to disregard the OMUTCD and make up their own designs of signs, pavement markings, et cetera. So hopefully you were paying attention because I know Ray went over this. He even, I think, said, Mark this down. You might see it on a question later. So we're almost over 80%. When we get there, I will close the poll out and then share the results. All right. Come on, three more percent. A couple more people, put your votes in, please. Okay, here we go. We're at 80%. All right, I'm going to share the results out. We had 6% said true. So. Those of you are going to have to rewatch this webinar when we send the recording to the link link recording out. But 94% of you wrote, apparently wrote the answer to the question down, and you have false. So, all right, Ray. Do you oh man, do I can't ten? believe six percent missed it. Come on, oh, people. All right. So I tell you, I'm going to hide the results, and Ray, you let me know when you want me to put another poll question up because I know we still have an hour to go, but we have three more questions. So thanks. All right, well, maybe those 6% are actually robots of some kind. All right, so uh, let's go. So this is what our the temporary traffic control manual looks like in a physical copy, but apparently uh, we've been told that they don't, um, they're not publishing it anymore, so you need to find it online. So uh, I'll be showing you how to find this manual online and uh, there's several different places you can go on the ODOT website and uh, including the Ohio LTAP website to uh, quickly find this manual and view it for free or even download it. Uh, also, um, it's the same with this handy dandy pocket guide, which is uh, actually titled Guidelines for Traffic Control in Work Zones. And uh, there's a new way to get a hold of this, and that's to download it as an app. We've actually had that app for uh, quite a while now, but we just recently had it updated so that the new um, what's this? What's the uh, Samsung style of phones called? Um, Android. So the we had it updated, so even the latest Android phones it'll work. So you just got to go to. Um, what's it called, the App Store or Google Play, depending on the type of phone you have, and then type in ODOT Work Zone, I think, and it will, then you'll find it. It's an orange colored app and it's free and uh, you can download it for free and use it as uh, we go through this uh, um, webinar series because I'll be asking questions from it. 
Ray, I will drop okay. the, link yes. to the app in the um, chat area. Okay. But we did have a question. Well, a lot of times that in. link that link still sometimes doesn't work, but yeah. if they search for it in Google yeah. Play, the it will work. So oh. keep that in mind, folks. Okay. We did have a question come in in the question box, and I'm going to put an answer to this okay. in there, but I wanted you to be able to address it too. It says, will ODOT okay. be publishing an entirely new OMUTCD, or are they just going to do a supplement for the update? Yeah, we're only going to do a supplement, and uh, we'll be getting the word out there um, for everybody to know of how to get their hands on that when it's done, because we're just now starting the process of developing that supplement. Okay, so this uh, pocket guide, it's obviously not as big as the temporary traffic control manual, but it was put together uh, to help people that deal with roadway maintenance activities or utility maintenance activities. And so as you uh, open up the app, you'll see that there are uh, pages of uh, it has specs of different temporary traffic control devices, and it has uh, on page 17. And if you're using the app, you click on those three lines at the top left corner and click on spacing, and uh, this chart will will pop up. And so um, these tables are very important uh, because what you do is you select a typical application and then you uh, the next step for your work zone design is to look at these tables and uh, it'll show you how to space your series of signs properly, depending on the type of road you're on and how to space your cones or drums, whether they're in a uh, taper or the buffer and workspace. Uh, and if, if you're, whether you're on a two lane road or a multi-lane road and in the bottom table is all about the length of different types of tapers um, and also the length of a buffer space. The far right column uh, tells you how long of a buffer space. So these uh, tables are very important to know about. And it also has some of the more common, not all the typical applications, but the ones that are associated typically with uh, roadway maintenance activities or utility maintenance activities. And it has this uh, work activity matrix uh, that helps you to select a typical application based upon the type of work you're conducting that day, whether you're mowing or pothole patching or trenching. Uh, so in this example, if you're pothole patching on a two-lane road, you would go across and see that you can select TA-10 or TA-17. And so TA-10 is a flagging operation and TA-17 is a mobile operation that we just talked about. So you need to select. ODOT crews are trained to select one or the other. Uh, but when it comes to locals, uh, I'll have some other ideas to discuss when we get to the section on mobile operations. Okay, so um, yeah, um, the best way to get this is through the app, but you can also view it from the LTAP website um, and download it from there. Uh, so I'm going to show you, um, quickly show you how to find these uh, resources and more online. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's first start out with uh, the Ohio LTAP website. So if you just Google Ohio LTAP, you'll come to our homepage here. I suggest that you save it to your favorites because if you work for a local government, you know, you're the reason we exist. We want you to be a regular participant of the Ohio LTAP program, you know, for training and technical assistance. And also we can uh, even talk about funding sources uh, for different roadway improvements. We're kind of a one-stop shop for locals. And so uh, if you want to find some work zone resources, let me say some more about training, you know, a lot of people are required to take a certain amount of training every year to maintain a license or a some sort of registration, uh, or maybe you're part of our Road Scholar program. So there's there's always a reason to take training. 
other than just making sure you're staying up to date on the latest best practices and latest specs. So we want you to use us for that training. We can provide all that for you. And so um, if you're looking for the temporary traffic control manual or the OMUTCD, then you can just click over here on the right where it says technical assistance, services, and resources. So if you just click on that, then this page pops up and then you scroll down and you see all kinds of fun stuff to click on. So including over here, the Build a Better Mousetrap program. Uh, got a deadline coming up on that. So we're hoping some more locals will uh, enter this competition. You can just click on that and read more about it. But as you scroll down, we'll, you'll see um, on the third row here is the guidelines for traffic control in work zones, pocket guide. So you can uh, click on that and uh, download it. And then on the fourth row is a direct link to the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So if you just click on that, it takes you to our OMUTCD page. And uh, when you scroll down, you can uh, click on any of the nine parts and appendices right here. So here's the hyperlink for part six, which is the Temporary Traffic Control Manual. <clears throat> And then let's take a look at uh, the ODOT Office of Roadway Engineering's page. And uh, when you get to their page, you can uh, click on uh, traffic control, which is a, a big uh, icon on their <clears throat> roadway engineering's homepage. And then, um, and then you can click on this standard construction drawings, maintaining traffic standard construction drawings. And so this is a cool resource because you can look at, uh, one thing you can do is look at the typical applications in the form of a standard construction drawing. <clears throat> and they also have other work zone setups that are not found in the manual. So let's quick take a quick look at a, uh, a closure of a, of a right lane on a four lane divided highway. So here's a, this jives with typical application 33. And uh, so here we see a, a right lane closure. It's a four lane roadway. You got your signs. It's the same signs that you would see on typical application number 33. It shows uh, the placement of a merging taper, which is our longest type of taper. It shows the placement of an arrow board. Uh, distance D here is uh, the buffer space, it shows the optional use of a truck mounted attenuator at the end of the buffer space and in the location of the work area. And it also has, you also find work zone setups that aren't in the manual. So like for instance, let me see where I was here, uh, set. Full set. What happened to that? Let's scroll down here. That's ITS. Hang on here. Maintaining traffic. So maintaining traffic, center construction drawings. Uh, like for instance, a lot of cities, a lot of local towns have a two-way left turn lane on some of their streets. Well, you can search all day long in the temporary traffic control manual, but you won't find out how to properly close that. But here we have a really good example. And so here's our, what they came up with for a, you can see this two-way left turn lane and the work set up across the hatched out area is the work area. And they're showing the, what signs to use. You got road work ahead followed by center lane closed ahead. And then they place the center lane close sign in front of the cones or drums right out in the two-way left turn lane. And then they use a no left turn sign in both directions. So you got signs in both directions. They're showing the placement of two optional truck mounted attenuators. So that's what they came up with. And then they also um, show the uh, kind of the opposite of that where um, 
maybe you're working in the through lane and you want to use the two way left turn lane um, in one way fashion to get traffic around you. So let's take a look at that. So here's here's that standard drawing. So we have the crew working in the in the through lane here, and then they're temporarily moving traffic around them in one way fashion in the two way left turn lane. And then it's showing all the associated signs. You've got choices of some signs to use there. And uh, you know this would be for you know a work duration of uh, you're going to be out there probably all day, and that's how they would handle that, or even long term, they would set it up that way. You could probably get by with a different way to do that if it was a very quick job. Okay, so um, so that is a good resource to know about. Um, You, know, you can also find uh, closing lanes in a roundabout on their website, whether it's a one lane roundabout where you use flaggers or two lane roundabout where you use uh, much like typical application 33 that we saw with the signs and arrow boards and cones. So those are some good resources to know about. Okay, so. Um, So I said that local authorities must abide by our OMUTCD. However, there are times when they need to come up with their own standards, when they have some roadway configurations or geometry that uh, you know is not mentioned in the uh, temporary traffic control manual. And so uh, you know they need to do the best they can uh, coming up with. Uh, their own standards there, like a few cities in Ohio have five and six legged intersections and uh, um, just some, you know, uh, non-standard uh, geometry with some of their roads. And so, um, you know, they usually meet with, uh, they usually don't come up with those local standards on their own. They usually include maybe their county engineer and uh, an ODOT district uh, traffic design engineer and things like that to help them come up with these um, standards. Okay, Did, uh, does there another question, Victoria? I have to unmute, sorry, well, at this time, um, but would you like to run another okay. question? Yeah, let's go ahead before I delve into the world of crash statistics. All right. I prefer to think of as crash data. Okay, data, we have data. All right, part six of the OMUTCD is also known as, and here's your options, work zone manual, MOT manual, temporary traffic control manual, emergency traffic control manual. <laughs> so make sure that you hit the escape button if you're in full screen mode so you can vote. People are voting fast and furious. I hope the class isn't uh, angry at me for making up such difficult questions, but maybe the, you know, as we progress through the series, you might find some more difficult questions. Well, I'm helping to build your confidence as test takers. Yeah, you know, this isn't intended to be the be all end all measuring your work zone knowledge, <laughs> but we do need to make sure that you're paying attention so yes. we can make sure. at least say that. Yep you were participating to give you your certificate. Yes. And we have, we're almost 80%. I need like one more person to vote here. All right, here we go. I'm gonna close it down and share the results. Okay, we have 7% that chose work zone manual, 2% uh -oh. chose MOT, and 3% oh, no. chose emergency traffic control. But 88% no. 88 of those that voted chose temporary traffic control manual, which is the correct answer, right, Ray? Yes, yes, temporary traffic control manual. All right. So I'm hiding that, and it is all yours again. I mean, I can't feel bad about the 12% because I swear I reiterated that. You did. Times. 
And, and they'll just All right. go back and watch the recording. I did want to mention that while Ray was talking to you um, about the, the different resources on our website, I did put links to both the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store that takes you directly to the pages where the WorkZone app is available. And we highly encourage you to download it, share that link with others. It's completely free. Um, we have people all over the country, actually, who are using this app, and they love it. Thanks, Ray. Okay, well, I think I have another quiz question here that I didn't tell you about, Victoria. Let's see what we've got here. Yes, let's see if they can answer this one in the chat box. Let's see uh, where everyone's... Uh, well, they'll have to drop it in the question box and set it in. Okay. Yeah, let's drop your answer in the question box, A, B, C, D, or E. How many work zone fatalities happened in 2023 in Ohio? So we've got the latest hot off the press statistics from last year. Mm, oh, wow, these answers are all over the page. We got E, D, B, D, B, C, D, 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 23. E C C C B D E E twenty-three mm -hmm. A B C C C C mm -hmm. C Let me know when you're ready for me to uh, whenever you're ready, Ray. All right. Well, I see we've got a lot of pessimists in today's webinar. So if you answer D or E. You know, you might be a pessimist, but the good news is, well, wait a minute. But if you're a total optimist, you, know, you might have said A, which is zero, you know, but, you know, we should always strive for zero when it comes to uh, the design and setup of our work zones. And, um, but unfortunately, the answer is not A, but, you know, we actually had, compared to the last decade we actually had the best year yet and so the answer is b nine so nine people lost their lives in ohio's work zones last year nine too and, many. Uh, as a result of a crash so uh yes nine too many uh we, um you know, we should always strive for zero and the main thing is we don't want a fatal crash in a work zone to be our fault. Okay, so um, so let's take a look at some statistics to see what these. Well, so let's delve into these statistics a little further. So we see, um, if we go back to 2018, we see that. Um, we, we averaged 20 a year, actually. And, uh, but uh, we came down to nine last year. So, you know, that, that's definitely an improvement. And so let's um, see what else we have. You know, we also had serious injuries in the, in the work zone. So we had 110 um, last year. 110 serious injuries, which is lower than the six year average. Then we had a total number of work zone crashes, uh, 4,098, uh, which uh, according to the average is the best year yet in the last six years. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? It's um, it's it's good. It's good to see the numbers coming down, right? Um, then what else? Let's see. Uh, who who was it that got injuries or, or fatal? So, uh, zero ODOT workers were killed. Um, but we did have 14 ODOT injuries. We had a contractor that was killed. Uh, contractors worker, and then we had nine contractor serious injuries. And so, um, if we looked at um, the top five work zone crash types in the last six years, um, 
here are some uh, numbers from that. Whether you know, the crash type could be rear end, side swipe passing, a fixed object crash, um, angle crashes like at an intersection or, or other object was hit. So when it comes to uh, fatalities, the statistics show that the the most common fatal crash is a rear end crash. And so if you think about it, you know, how, how would that happen? Well, it's, um, you know, it, it would have to be a high speed impact from behind. And, you know, that means that traffic had to stop. And, um, you know, the thing with a work zone, if it's on a section of a highway and not an intersection, then you have traffic stopping in places that they don't normally have to stop. And so it might be uh, if people are not paying attention and uh, when a big truck pulls out of the work zone or maybe a flagger has to stop traffic or, you know, things like that. Um, if someone's not paying attention, um, you know, they could their mind is elsewhere because they're, they're they're at a place where they don't normally have to stop. They're usually going the speed limit. And so it catches them off guard. And by the time they know the vehicle in front of them is stopped, it's too late. Um, so pedestrians and fixed objects uh, are common fatal crashes. And then we have side swipe passing and parked vehicles. You know, part of our some of our training, we talk about cars parked in the uh, work zone, and uh, we generally do not permit vehicles to be parked in the advanced warning area and transition area, uh, or even the buffer space of work zones. To and that this is now you know why, because you know if you have a car parked in any of those places, it's possible that your your parked vehicle becomes a fixed object crash. And so you should not be parking vehicles in those three areas of the work zone. Okay, so what else do we have here? Uh, then the type of work zone, um, we broke down the statistics from there. What, you know, a lot of work zones involve a lane closure, um, you know, the actual travel lane being closed. And then we have, uh, Maybe you're working on the shoulder or the median, uh, but a lane closure work zone type is the most common. You know, when we get into lane shifts and crossovers, you know, there usually isn't a conflict there, uh, but yet the crashes still happen, as you can see. Uh, mobile operations or intermittent work, and then others. So, so in 2023. We see that 569 in the lane closure uh, is a lot lower than the five-year average for that. And then um, work zones are broken down into different elements or parts. And so we've, uh, with these statistics, we broke down the work zone, work zone fatalities and injuries by the which area or parts of the work zone did the crash happen. So the work area or activity area is the most common area for these crashes to happen. Transition areas where we're moving traffic from one lane to another as part of a lane closure. And then the advanced warning area is like, like where the signs are located before the transition area. You know, maybe, maybe traffic had to you know, it's, it's, it's a place where you have traffic weaving from one lane to another. Sometimes they're looking over their shoulder, changing lanes when they don't realize the traffic in front of them has stopped or slammed on their brakes. And uh, then we have before the first work zone warning sign. And then the termination area is where is at the very end of the work zone where traffic uh, returns to their normal path. And then, um, you know, top 10 objects struck in a work zone, fixed object crashes um, were quite common as you saw. And so we have, 
And what are they running into out there? So we have a median concrete barriers for our long-term work zones. Maybe they swerved and hit a guardrail or swerved and went into a ditch or crashed into some sort of maintenance work zone equipment, a portable barrier, uh, the end of a guardrail, maybe the, the impact attenuator or crash cushion. Uh, then we get into traffic signs, utility poles. So those are all, when you run into these things, it's, it's a, those are fixed objects. Then they even went uh, steps further and broke down the statistics by, uh, by the age and gender uh, of crashes that involve speeding. And so they get into, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, the males are the blue. And so males between the age of 26 to 35 was the highest category for drivers at fault in a work zone crash. And, um, and of course, well, 16, you could just say 16 to 35, really. And, uh, and then the 16 to 25 is the highest category for females for being at fault while speeding. Then you get into distracted driving. You know, we have a new law uh, to try to crack down on distracted driving crashes. And so, you know, um, 16 to 25, you have a, a little, little bit more uh, females being at fault. But then when you get to 26 to 35, you have the same number of males and females in distracted work zone crashes. Hey, Ray. And then, uh, yes. A question that came in. Someone wanted to know uh, what kind of work zones have the most fatalities? Would you happen to know the answer to that? I think uh, it's coming up. Let me okay. see here. Well, we'll see it when Let's you see. get well. There. Well, here, now it'll be this one here, so. It looks like that's areas of, here. oh, by well, work this zone is type. The, oh. the work zone type, a lane closure. I mean, you had, you had the highest number of crashes in the, or fatalities and, and injuries in the act, act, activity area. Um, Of, uh, of work zones. So it'd be the activity area, you probably have a lane closure would be the answer to that. Thank you. Okay, so then they even broke it down uh, at fault drivers uh, by age group uh, for drug related work zone crashes. And uh, so you see the males from 26 to 35. So, those are some uh, statistics about work zone crashes and uh, sort of stuff that our Office of Highway Safety does. I mean, they're, they're the uh, king, kings and queens of statistics over there. So anytime you have a question about any type of crash statistics, you can contact our Office of Highway Safety. Okay, so uh, this slide deals with uh, a site distance restriction. And it's also the scene of a work zone fatality happened in Northeast Ohio um, within the last five years. But um, we've been partnering with uh, an agency called PERP the last five years. And uh, they go out, they're part of the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation. And uh, PERP stands for Public Employees Risk Reduction Program. They're basically the OSHA for public employees. And then uh, in this, they go out and randomly inspect work zones that are set up by locals and uh, make sure they're set up right. If not, they get cited. <clears throat> and uh, so in this, these two pictures, it's the same stretch of roadway. The pictures are just taken from uh, different ends of this stretch of roadway. So on the left, we see, you know, we're looking at the hill in the background and you can see a vehicle going up that hill at the bottom of the hill. And then in the right picture, we're standing on top of that hill in the background of the left picture. And you notice that we cannot see that vehicle. 
So, but we know it's there, but we can't see it. So that's a sight distance restriction. And uh, so this was a scene of a, a fatal crash where uh, the crew actually decided they were doing some uh, crack sealing on the road. They thought the best way to set up a work zone would be to close the road. So they set up type three barricades on both ends of the road. But that was all they did. And there's, you know, other houses on that road that are, you know, inside where they closed it. And uh, they didn't tell anybody else that there was, that they'd be working on the road. And so someone came out of the driveway and got up to about 55 miles an hour coming down this road. And the crew was working in both lanes of crack ceiling and they, um, they slammed on the brakes best they could, but they hit one of the workers. And uh, so it's very sad, but uh, you know, when you're working on a roadway where there's a sight distance restriction, uh, you know, you need to make sure that, you, that we're providing the advance warning and guidance uh, for the motorists, especially on a two lane uh, high speed roadway. You know, high speed begins at 45 and this road has a 55 mile per hour speed limit. <laughs> And, um, you know, they should have had signs and a flagger out there and some kind of should have been a flagging operation throughout this stretch of roadway. And uh, so we should all learn from their mistakes and uh, not let this happen anymore and uh, make sure we consider site distance restrictions as part of our maintenance of traffic plan. Okay. So we went over a lot there uh, in that part one, uh, talking about uh, the OMUTCD and uh, the temporary traffic control manual and uh, how to find work zone resources online through the Ohio LTAP website and the ODOT Office of Roadway Engineering's page. And so let's uh, use that information as we uh, continue on. So our next part, we're going to talk about these uh, temporary traffic control devices uh, that we use in our work zones and uh, some other stuff to go along with uh, this uh, subject. So what is the purpose of temporary traffic control devices? Well, we use these devices to communicate to our all of our road users. <clears throat> they are the best way to communicate to our road users, our motorists, pedestrians, et cetera. Uh, how else could we communicate with them? Uh, we can't send out a mass text or a mass email to let them know that we're closing a lane, right? We don't want them looking at their phones. So, um, but sometimes even our best efforts at communications don't work because, uh, well, we've seen some drivers do some pretty stupid things. Here we have a picture of a, a situation caused by a driver doing something stupid. So we have a, a road closure. It was a, probably a, about a week long project for this two lane rural road. So we had to close it with our type three barricades. And so uh, one of the mornings when our workers showed up to get back to work. This is what they found in the work zone waiting on them. So uh, this vehicle went around the barricades and quickly found out why the road was closed. And so uh, we had to call up on our friends at the State Highway Patrol and uh, get this taken care of. So we've actually learned some lessons from this incident. So like, uh, now we always put a wall of cones in front of the trench as well. And uh, we have our um, vehicle operator, uh, operator of this crane or giant backhoe uh, to close the bucket more so a, a car can't drive through there. Okay, so our traffic control devices are essential to highway safety. They're recognized subconsciously and uh, you know, they are the best way to communicate. And uh, we have some requirements of our traffic control devices. 
we use them uh, to fulfill a need, uh, they must command attention. Of course, if you're using the latest devices, they do command attention. These are not the uh, the signs and cones of our grandfathers. Uh, you know, they've been updated to be uh, more colorful and uh, retro reflective and things like that. Uh, they convey a clear and simple message and uh, they are placed properly in order to give adequate time for the motorists to respond the way we need them to respond. Here's a, here's a sign that uh, we all know of and what it means. It's a symbol for a larger word. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've learned from this, the golden arches as far as uh, using symbols on our signs, especially for work zones. Um, so we'll take a look at some of our uh, symbols for our signs here in a minute. So we're trying to establish uniformity through standardization. And that's for all traffic control. Uh, when we do that, we're promoting uh, better recognition and understanding of these devices, a more consistent interpretation, uh, rapid driver response, motorist respect, and even reduced traffic control costs. Here we found some old signs from the ODOT archives. Uh, here we have uh, duct tape being used to help spell out the message. And this one's using electrical tape doesn't look as sticky as duct tape. Those kind of fallen off. Then here we have duct tape again to cover up the left turn arrow here. That doesn't command a lot of respect. But those are very old pictures and uh, we don't see that anymore, at least from ODOT. But, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to establish uniformity in all of our devices. And uh, when we say uniform, we're talking about being uniform in three different ways. In the design of the device, like this sign here, it's a diamond shaped sign with orange colors and black letters. Then we have, uh, you know, when we use it, to, you know, the application of that device and then where we place that device. The location is very important. So when I say traffic control devices, I'm talking about all of these devices. We have our um, signs, channelizing devices, arrow panels, and, um, you know, these uh, portable changeable message boards are becoming more common, which is good. Uh, pavement markings, sometimes in our long-term work zones, we have to remove permanent pavement markings and install temporary pavement markings. And then we have barriers and barricades. So let's uh, talk a little bit about our signs. What do they do for us? Well, they advise and warn drivers. You know, they're placed usually in the advanced warning area of our work zone. And signs can communicate four different ways. So they're words, color, shape, and symbols. And they communicate the same message redundantly through their shape and color. So you know, here's, a, here's an example of how these signs communicate. I bet you know what this top left sign is here. And uh, the stop sign, of course. The triangle here is the yield sign. You should know that. Uh, this rectangle over on the right, you know, that might be a speed limit sign um, or some other regulatory sign that if you don't obey it, you would get a ticket. Uh, the looks like a house here. We know that's a school zone sign. And then in a circle, circular sign, that's a railroad crossing sign. And then the top right is a diamond sign. That's a warning sign. Any diamond shaped sign, that's a, if you're not gonna read all the signs, you wanna make sure you read all the diamond shaped signs. <clears throat> and uh, that'd be uh, important for your safety. So uh, it might be a yellow diamond shaped sign. That's a, a permanent warning sign for like the curve ahead or deer crossing or, you know, bridge freezes before the roadway. Or, or, but it might be <clears throat> orange as well for our so road work ahead or a flagger symbol. And uh, of course the colors of a sign communicate a message as well. Yellow for warning, red for prohibition, like stop and do not enter and uh, wrong way. And then orange of course is for our construction or roadway maintenance. As soon as someone sees the orange sign, they know there's a work zone ahead. They need to see that so they can adjust their driving accordingly. They know it's not business as usual. Then white uh, rectangular signs with black letters are regulatory and then 
uh, FYG is a very important color, um, especially for school zones and bicycle crossings, pedestrian crossing, it stands for fluorescent yellow green. And uh, it's important for anybody working in the public right away, because you know you need to wear uh, your fluorescent yellow green apparel, because uh, uh, the manual says so, and uh, it distinguishes you from anything else in the work zone. People can see you from a thousand feet if you're wearing the proper fluorescent yellow green, and they know that uh, there are people there in the work zone. We need to let the motorists know that there's workers actually working, and uh, so they need to see the fluorescent yellow green. And you can even supplement that by saying, having a sign that says workers in roadway if you so desire. Okay, uh, you know, there's different types of signs. So three general types of signs, regulatory, warning, and guide signs. And uh, it turns out that sometimes we even use regulatory signs in our work zones. Like if we're working in a, at an intersection, sometimes at intersections we need to enhance our signage to better communicate to the motorist to uh, like which lane to be in or uh, you know, a certain lane must turn right. Uh, but these are our rectangular signs with white background and they contain uh, legal obligations. You know, here's uh, some of our regulatory signs, but the bottom left one says left lane must turn left. And so uh, if you look at typical application number 23, you'll see that sign in use at an intersection. And uh, typical application 22 has uh, almost the reverse of that saying right lane must turn right. So um, then we have our warning signs that we're more familiar with, our orange diamond shaped signs with black letters. Here's uh, some of uh, our common work zone signs. You see some symbols here, the symbol of the man with the shovel that uh, can be used on the back of your shadow truck if you're setting up a uh, mobile operation for patching potholes. And then we have the flag or symbol sign for it goes along with the flagging operation. You don't don't ever flag without the flag or symbol sign uh, in advance of you, just like in typical application number ten. Hey, Ray. And uh, yes, you have someone who's incredibly observant on this webinar, and they said right. that you skipped slide number sixty. Uh oh. Just thought I'd mention that. Uh oh. Let's see what that one says. And I'm scared. Slide 60 is just giving you the type of sign uh, by the shape. So okay. it's, uh, you know, the stop sign is octagonal and the yield sign is triangular. Warning signs are diamond shaped, regulatory rectangle. The right, school sign is the house. To mention it. So, and okay. whenever you want me to do another poll question, I'll be happy to do that. Um, it's one concerning portable the size sign. of signs. No, the one. Okay, I'm not there yet. Okay. So they better right. pay attention since they know what's coming yeah, up. Yeah, they better. I'm coming up on something good. Thanks. Um, the be prepared to stop sign that you see in the top row, that's a uh, pretty important sign that uh, all ODOT workers know about uh, as part of our flagging operation. So if you, uh, you know, we talked about the notes page on a uh, typical application. You know, the illustration for typical application number 10, which is the flagging operation on a two lane road, you won't see this sign in the illustration. But then when you read the guidance and options on the notes page, and you will see it mentioned twice. So it enhances the safety of your flagging operation simply by installing the be prepared to stop sign uh, right before the flag or symbol sign. So that's a good example there of why you need to read the notes page. Speed limit 35, is that the proper speed limit sign design? No, it's not, is it? So we know it's supposed to be rectangular with a white background and black letters. And if you wanted to decrease the speed through a work zone, you could, you could attach the advisory, an orange advisory speed plaque to the bottom of your 
one of your work zone advanced warning signs. Okay, so if we're working on a lane closure, we uh, and it's a uh, it's not a mobile operation, it's a stationary operation. We definitely need a series of signs in the advanced warning area. And that's why each typical application shows us how to space the signs. And so we don't want to create the situation here that Ziggy is facing. Um, so let's see how we're supposed to do it. So each typical application that involves a series of signs like this one here, the flagging operation, typical application number 10, it's showing you like the distance from the flagger, this uh, red symbol here is the flagger. The distance from the flagger to the flagger symbol sign is a distance of A. And the distance from the flagger symbol sign to the one lane road ahead sign is distance B. And the distance from one lane road ahead sign to road work ahead sign is distance C. And so there's four roadway types and uh, each one of those has a different value for A, B, and C. So if you look at, uh, if you downloaded the app uh, that I told you about, uh, you could uh, click on the spacing button and then you would see this table. And uh, it shows you um, the advanced warning sign spacing requirements for the four different types of roads. So you have urban low speed streets and urban high speed streets. So you got rural roads, you know, you, rural roads are, you, you know, could be two lane, 55 mile per hour rural roads. Then you have freeways and expressways. And as you can see, the values of A, B, and C are all very different. So you might be asking, well, what's uh, urban low? What's the difference between urban low speed and urban high speed? Well, here's the answer. You got uh, urban streets that have a speed limit of 40 mile per hour and below is urban low speed. High speed begins at 45. So why do we have a series of signs? It's because each sign has their own job to do. So the first sign, road work ahead. That's where we first put the motorists on notice that uh, it's not business as usual and uh, there's a work zone ahead and they need to adjust their driving and be on the lookout for the next sign. And the next sign is where we communicate to them what the situation is, like right lane closed ahead, for example, or in a flagging operation, it's the one lane road ahead sign. And then we have the third sign is where we tell them what we want them to do. So, uh, you know, that standard construction drawing I showed you that I said jives with typical application 33, that third sign was the merge left symbol sign. So we need them to merge left. Or the third sign of flagging operation is uh, either the be prepared to stop or the flagger symbol sign. So basically be prepared to do what the flagger is telling you to do. This looks like an important slide, the height of a sign. So uh, most um, roadway maintenance and utility maintenance operations that only last uh, for a day or less, you know, usually you're not installing post-mounted signs, you're installing portable signs. And so portable signs need to be placed on a stand such that the bottom of the sign is no less than one foot above the traveled way. And then your long-term work zones and permanent signs, they have a different standard. So in rural areas, those signs can be five feet above the traveled way or seven feet above the ground where they're mounted in urban areas. So here's a good looking uh, portable sign. It's on a stand so that the bottom of the sign is uh, at least a one foot a height above the traveled way. It even has flags on it. So the flags are there to draw attention to the sign. I know uh, not every agency puts flags on their signs, but uh, 
you know, you could if you wanted to. Uh, it's a good idea. And then, uh, but if you don't have flags, you can also put a, your shiniest, newest cone beside your sign. And that would draw attention to the sign. So you don't want to block the sign with the cone, but you put it beside it so you can still read the sign. Okay, so um, you might not know it yet, but you, uh, you're kind of like work zone experts already with everything that uh, you've learned today. So let's uh, prove that uh, by having take, taking this little picture quiz. So, you know, sometimes you see these uh, quizzes where you look at a picture and see how many things you can find that are wrong with it. So if we take a look at this picture on the left, can you find anything that's wrong? Um, I'll start, uh, or maybe there aren't, maybe there isn't anything wrong is your answer. You know, I'm starting to have doubts about that, uh, 12%, uh, so, uh. Okay, we're getting some answers on the question box. Oh. Not, a, not on portable stand, no one foot minimum, right. missing right. shoulder taper, sign to uh -huh. improper distance, wrong sign and spacing, less <laughs> one foot, sign is not one foot minimum. Incorrect device spacing. You tell me when to stop, right? All right. That's long enough. Okay. All right. Very good, class. Uh, so you obviously have discovered that it's not an acceptable work zone. Uh, it's an epic failure, basically. So, you know, when I talked about how there are variables on every road, let's uh, nail down the variables for this location. So it's a two-lane road. We got that nailed down. It's not an expressway. Uh, we know that it's not a low volume road because I can see some commercial trucks coming up here on the, uh, on the opposite lane in the, in the background, I see two trucks coming. That's carrying commercial traffic. Um, and just by the looks of it, I would say it's, it's probably a 55 mile per hour road. It looks like the Cadillac of two lane rural roads. So it is a rural area. Look at this. They got a paved shoulder. They've got uh, white edge lines and a painted uh, dash center line. So that means passing is allowed. But, uh, and by looking at what they're doing here with a, uh, with this equipment on the uh, low boy and uh, the men standing around and it uh, looks like there's a lot to do there. See a pile of dirt, I think over here. So it doesn't look like a 15 or less minute job. It looks like they're going to be there. You know, so I'm going to assume they're going to be there for four hours. So remember, there's 46 typical applications. And uh, with the variables that I just nailed down, there's only one out of 46 that would be an acceptable typical application to install. And uh, since we're running out of time, I'll just tell you what that is. It's typical application number 10, the flagging operation. So we know it cannot be a mobile operation because they're going to be there for four hours in a stationary position. And so they need to follow typical application number 10 with all the signs, the flaggers at both ends, and uh, buffer space and all that stuff. So we'll be getting into that when we get to, to, to discussing flagging. So that's so, an epic failure. Ray, there's yes. two minutes left. Two minutes. I got to wrap up. All right. So uh, here's a stop sign in an urban setting. So that is not the correct height. It needs to be at least seven feet above the ground to uh, because of pedestrians and bicyclists and on-street parking. Okay. So uh, the manual goes uh there's a lot to read about signs for work zones and uh in this section uh of the manual of part six uh, it says signs shall be properly maintained for cleanliness visibility and correct positioning it then goes on to say that signs that have lost significant legibility shall be promptly replaced so it's important that the uh, local governments have everyone on the work crew is a knows uh, the process of replacing signs and recognizing when they need to be replaced and that they need to be visible. So these signs here are not acceptable. They do not meet the, the standards. They need to be replaced. Uh, working at night, 
if you work at night, then you're using the same signs, but they must be retro reflectorized. And so uh, they got to meet the latest retro reflectivity standards. So in this case, uh, retro reflective means that when a headlights hit the sign at night, then the light, no matter what the angle of the headlight, it reflects back to the source of the headlight. It's very important. So if you're not using re retro reflective signs and you're working at night, well, basically the signs disappear at night. So it's very dangerous to not have retro reflective signs for night work. So I've gone over a lot of information there about signs. I was just gonna, you know, kind of show that uh, when we look at uh, the manual at all the different typical applications that, uh, you know, you don't have to guess at what signs to use. These typical applications shows you what signs to use. And so, you know, like uh, like typical application number 10, you don't have to guess about what signs to use in a flagging operation. You got to go up to typical application number 10 and here it is. So you got, it shows That's you. That's a good place to pick back up next time, Ray. Yeah. Yeah, okay. so uh, I'm gonna be respectful I kind of finished of our up, I need to say time. about our signs. And then, uh, then when we come back for the next session, we'll talk some more about some of the other uh, temporary traffic control devices. And uh, then we'll get into, um, let's see, our next session will be called um, Elements of a Traffic Control Plan and Different uh, Work Zone Traffic Control Layouts. Great. And each session can get credit as standalone. So if you are or you know of anyone who is interested in the additional topics, please feel free to invite them for upcoming sessions. Ray, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And I know everyone online does. So we will um, be getting certificates out to you probably in the next couple of days. Ray is the one that normally issues those. So. Give him a day or two. He's pretty busy with it being work zone season right now. But thank you all for being on the webinar today. Yep. And rem remind uh, everyone that's viewing this from a conference room with uh, different people that make sure someone uh, scans that sign-in sheet to me right after this. Absolutely. So take care. Have a rest, safe rest of your day. And we will see you on the next webinar. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody.